Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our Friday seminars, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker today, Dr. Guan Yang Wang from Rutgers University. And first of all, he has he actually had a scheduled conflict today, so I'm actually glad that he could still make it despite that and be here with us. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, Guan Yang is an assistant professor in the Department of Statistics at Rutgers University. And prior to joining Rutgers, he did his PhD in mathematics from Stanford University under the supervision of the legendary Percy Diakonis. Um, and his Guan Yang has done a lot of interesting work in, in research interests lie at the intersection of probability theory, Bayesian statistics, and theory of MCMC methods. And he already has some very good papers in all these areas. And today he's going to tell us about some of his recent, very recent work actually on unbiased multi-level MCMC methods for impractable distributions. So please join me in welcoming Tuanya. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for the very nice introduction and it's my great pleasure to be here and present our very recent work it's actually not even posted on archive it's not already available on my homepage, but we hope to post it on archive maybe in the next two weeks but feel free to check my website to take a look at the paper if you find it interesting so this is a joint work with Tianzhe, who is a recently like uh, admitted student in our statistics department. And the talk is titled, the title is long, basically is unbiased multi-level Monte Carlo methods for intractable distributions. So the talk will be organized as follows. First of all, I will do a very like a brief introduction on the problem with a few motivating examples. And then I will briefly review some existing results. And in particular, I will highlight two methodology. One is called unbiased MCMC. The other is called unbiased MLMC. So MCMC, I know many of you are already familiar with. That's the short name for Markov chain Monte Carlo. And MLMC is the short for multi-level Monte Carlo, which is also a celebrated Monte Carlo method, but mostly developed in the operation research and maybe applied math area. So from the discussion, I hope at that time it will be clear why the problem I want to solve is connected with both of these methods. So I will then introduce our method, talk about its, some of its generalization and talk some theoretical properties of our method. And if I still have time, I will briefly go through some numerical experiments to see how it is implemented on some like numerical examples. Okay. So since everything here is about unbiasedness or unbiased estimators, so maybe I will just start with defining unbiasedness. Suppose we have some quantity of our interest, we call the quantity A. It can actually be a relatively arbitrary quantity. It could be the parameter of your favorite statistical model, or it could be an expectation over a challenging underlying probability distribution. What we want to do is usually this A is computationally intractable, so we can we want to estimate this quantity. And suppose we have our estimator, we call that X, then the underlying distribution of the X, we just call the underlying distribution P. Then the bias of our estimator is just the difference between the expectation of our estimator and the ground truth A. And in fact, the estimator will be called unbiased if the bias term equals zero. So a very quick example is the Gaussian location model. Suppose we have data which ID come from multivariate Gaussian distribution with mean vector theta and covariance matrix identity. If we are interested in theta, of course, we can come up with the empirical mean estimator to estimate the vector. In fact, uh, like a mathematical statistics tells us theta has some more property. It's like the UMVE is the maximum likelihood estimator, but also from the like uh, celebrated science phenomenon, it tells us when the D is relatively high, it's greater than or equal to three, then this natural estimator is inadmissible, which means in terms of the mean square error, you can find a better estimator than this unbiased one. So that gives us a question. Even in this simple example, the unbiasedness is not necessarily a good property because with some bias, if you reduce the variance, you actually get a better estimator. So why we really need unbiasedness? In fact, in a classical point estimation point of view, unbiasedness is probably a less important property. 
For example, Larry Wasserman wrote in his famous textbook, All of Statistics, he said, unbiasedness used to receive much attention, but this this is considered to be less important. And I guess it's considered to be less important than some other quantities like the mean square error, which we know basically is the bias square plus the variance. However, if we are in a Monte Carlo world, suppose we're able to simulate our estimator and we're able to simulate that independently on multiple processes, then unbiasedness could be a useful property. So for example, Jeff Rosenthal, who is an expert in MCMC, he wrote in his paper, Parallel Computing and the Monte Carlo Algorithms. We're running parallel Monte Carlo with many processes. It's more important to start with an unbiased estimate than with a low variance estimate. So the reason behind this is if you are able to get an unbiased estimator, then the error totally comes from the variance. But if we are able to simulate our estimator on parallel processes, then we can quantify or we can control the variance. We can control it to an arbitrarily low level by adding the number of processes we have. However, on the other hand, if we have another estimator which is biased, even though the bias can be low, then averaging the output from multiple parallel processes will not help with decreasing the bias. So let me illustrate a little bit more on this, on this very like a hypothetical example. So suppose we want to estimate two, oh, the same quantity using two estimators. The first that those are all Monte Carlo estimators, which means you are able to simulate it from a computer algorithm. So the first estimator, assume it has zero bias and one variance. The second estimator has 0.1 bias and 0.1 variance. Then in terms of a single estimator, the second one might be preferred because it has a smaller mean square error. However, if we run it on really on multiple processes and average them, then we know that the variance of both estimator will decay linearly with the number of processes. So for the first estimator, the mean square error totally comes from the variance. So the variance will decay linearly with the number of processes. When n, goes, when n which is the number of processes, goes to infinity, you will eventually have like a mean square error goes to infinity. However, for the second estimator, even though the bias is 0.1, if you take the average among different processes, the bias will still be 0.1. No matter how many processes you have, the bias will still be there. So the mean square error will always be like a lower bounded by the bias square. So this is one reason that uh, in this situations that unbiasedness could be an appealing property. And there are other reasons that unbiasedness is important because of the time I'm not able to discuss about them, but those are on the current manuscript. And in particular, if you have other examples that you find unbiasedness is an interesting or important property, please let me know since I'm also interested in like other or more applications. Okay, so we mentioned unbiasedness could be important in parallel implementing, implementing Monte Carlo. So maybe let's back, get back to Monte Carlo methods. Basically, we know that Monte Carlo methods directly provide us unbiased estimator for some integrals. For example, this is an illustrative example that we use Monte Carlo methods to estimate the numerical value of pi. So what we are doing is we are uniformly generate points from the unit square and use those points to gen come up with an estimator to estimate pi. In this specific example, the, the, the font is probably too small, but basically, the estimated value is 3.13, which is accurate up to two digits. And if we add more points, the result can be more and more accurate. And basically we'll have an unbiased estimator and the accuracy will, be, uh, will increase depending on how many points you are used, how many computational resources you have. But when we are saying Monte Carlo methods give us an unbiased estimator, we have implicitly make two assumptions. The first assumption is we are really able to sample from the underlying probability distribution. In this example, it's the unit, it's a uniform distribution of the unit, sphere, uh, unit square, which is easy to sample from. But in practice, if you have a base posterior distribution, then that could be very difficult to sample from. And the second assumption is we are really interested in an integral or in an expectation. So what I want to argue in the next few examples is in many practical applications, this two assumption can be easily violated. The underlying distribution can be hard to sample from and the quantity of our interest may not be an integral. It may be some like a more complete, maybe take some more complicated form. 
So the first example is the square lattice icing model, which is developed in statistical physics, but now it's being also widely used to model binary data with applications in, for example, spatial statistics, uh, image processing, and network analysis. So this model basically is a probability distribution over all the spin configurations. And each spin configuration can be viewed as a square matrix of size n by n, and each entry takes value plus one or minus one. So as we can see, the spin configuration, there are, this is a probability distribution supported on two to the power of n square total possible configurations. So when n is moderately large, then the state space is already an astronomical number. So for each fixed spin configuration, it puts probability this one is exponential to the power of negative theta h sigma over z theta. And the theta is the parameter of our model, which we are usually interested in the parameter, which is the inverse temperature. h of sigma is called the Hamiltonian function, and z of theta is called the partition function. So if we look at this model, we will find the numerator is easy because the numerator is essentially just an exponential function. And the Hamiltonian function itself is quite easy to evaluate. But the denominator is quite a difficult. The, uh, the denominator, which is the partition function, is essentially the normalization constant of the probability distribution. So it can be written as the summation over summation of the numerator over all the possible spin configurations. And we know that there are two to the power of n squared possibilities, so we are summing up an astronomical number. Therefore, for moderate n, in practice, we're never really being able to exactly calculating out this z theta just because it's too complicated. The best thing we can do is to estimate this partition function. So suppose we have one specific task for fixed two temperature theta one and theta two. Suppose we want to estimate the ratio of this normalization constant. So I think in statistical physics, Physics, this is called the free energy difference. And there are also statistics applications such as uh, hypothesis testing and so on. So uh, Wen Wan and Xiao Li Meng wrote a beautiful paper in the 1990s in Statistica Sinica on the different approaches and applications for estimating this kind of ratio of normalization constants. So if we want to estimate this, then by some algebraic manipulation, we can write this ratio as a ratio of two expectations. So in this case, the quantity of our interest is the ratio of two expectations. So basically, this whole thing is not an expectation. It can be written as a function of two expectations, but itself isn't an expectation. So the quantity of our interest is not necessarily an expectation in this example. And the underlying distribution, which is the icing model, it can be very difficult to sample from. So that's the example. Eh, sorry. The second example is widely used in operation research is called the optimal stopping problem. So the optimal stopping problem is basically a game. The game rule is I'm, I'm be able to see a reward at each round of the game. So the reward itself may be a random variable and the distribution evolves according to some, mar, uh, some underlying stochastic process. Um, what I need to do is I need to make one decision at each round. I can, easy, I can either take the reward back home or I can let the reward go and keep playing the game with the hope that I can see some larger reward in the future. But in many cases, there are only finitely many rounds. So that's a decision making problem. I needed to, based on my current information, I need to make my best decision to see if I want to stop my process or not. So basically I want to wisely choose the stopping time and that's called the optimal stopping problem. One typical application of the optimal stopping is the option pricing problem. Basically, suppose there is some underlying stock with, has, we usually assume the price of the stock satisfies some like a stochastic process. For example, people sometimes assume it satisfies the geometric Brownian motion. And an option, if I buy a put option, it means I want the stock price to be as low as possible. So if I buy a put option at strike price K, then it means the, if the stock price is lower than K, I can earn some money. If it's greater than K, then I don't earn any money from my option. Usually when I buy an option, I have an expiration date. Let's say the expiration date is T years. So there are different kinds of options. And the one kind is called American option, which allows you to early exercise. 
early exercise means you can exercise it at any time from now to two years later. You don't have to wait until the expiration date to see if you earn any money. You can actually early exercise your option. So obviously that is an optimal stopping problem. You want to know when is the best time for me to exercise my option. So that's an optimal stopping problem. And the optimal policy, the optimal strategy has expected utilities usually formulated as this formula, which is basically take a supremum over all the possible strategies here. Each strategy corresponds to a stopping time, and I want to calculate this quantity. Usually, this quantity cannot be analytically solved, so we have to use Monte Carlo methods to estimate this quantity. And this formulation itself is still a little bit intractable for us to design any Monte Carlo methods. So typically, we write this UT by a dynamic programming. And I'm not showing the general dynamic programming formula, but for the simple case where t equals two, then basically the expectation of the optimal policy is this quantity. So this is something called nested expectation in the Monte Carlo literature. It's called a nested expectation because basically it's a comp nested expectation is basically a complicated expectation. So it's an expectation of a max function we must have a max, max function because I need to make decisions. So that's where the max function comes into play. And the max function itself depends on two components. One component is what you observed for your first reward. And the second component is your best guess for the future. So that's a conditional expectation. So that's the structure of this problem. A nested expectation is an expectation of a function of an expectation. So in this case, standard Monte Carlo, this is considered as a very challenging task for standard Monte Carlo method. And in fact, uh, the vanilla Monte Carlo method, of, like uh, we can come up with, is basically use some inner or uh, outer loop and some inner loop to generate Monte Carlo estimate. Usually they have suboptimal convergence rates. So this is another example. In this example, the underlying distribution really depends on our problem model assumption. It can be quite difficult. And the quality of our interest is the nested expectation. So it is an expectation, but it's somehow a complicated expectation. Uh, the last example is very short. It's a quantile estimation problem. Basically, we know that's very important in statistics. We have some underlying probability distribution and we want to estimate the quantile of the distribution. And in this case, again, the quantity of our interest is not an expectation. It's a functional of the probability measure. For each probability measure, it has a corresponding Q quantile if we fix Q, but it's not an expectation. And the underlying probability distribution can be easy or can be very difficult. So based on these examples, we can make a very quick summary. Basically, most inference problems can be viewed as estimating this quantity. I call this quantity T of pi. And the T stands for a functional, which maps from the space of probability measures to some quantity, to some real or vector val valued state space. And the pi is the underlying probability distribution, which can be uni or multivariate. And what we want to do is we want to construct unbiased estimators of this quantity because unbiased estimators has those appealing properties, especially if we are running them in parallel. So this problem in its most general form is very, very challenging. And the difficulty comes from both components of the T-pi pair. So I will discuss the difficulty and reveal the existing results in a minute. But before I talk existing results, let me be a little bit more clear on what I mean by difficult. So for the underlying probability distribution pi, we'll say the underlying distribution is easy if we can perfectly simulate from that distribution. So Gaussian is easy, uniform is easy, Poisson is also easy, but the like a posterior distribution of like a, the base model can be difficult, it's, except that you are using some conjugate prior. And we will say the functional T is easy if it's an integral operator. Basically, if we're interested in the expectation of some trackable function, but otherwise we will say the T can be very difficult. So the, the ratio of two expectations is difficult, quantile is difficult, and the nested expectation is difficult. So what are the existing device techniques for different problems? Basically, this easy and difficult classification already partitions the whole space into four regions. You have easy T, easy pi, 
difficult difficult pi easy t uh, easy pi difficult t and a difficult t difficult pi. So in the easiest case, the distribution is easy to sample from, and we're interested in an expectation. Then the vanilla Monte Carlo method works pretty well. So you can still the vanilla Monte Carlo method already gives you unbiased estimation. Of course, we can talk about how to do the variance reduction and how to do any kind, all kind of improvement. But if we just want an unbiased estimator, then the vanilla Monte Carlo method already works pretty well. The second category is you have difficult pi and easy t. So this is already very challenging because this already contains all the examples if we're interested in estimating the, doing Bayesian inference, we want to estimate the posterior expectation for any function of our interest. So the difficulty comes from the fact that pi cannot be directly sampled. So the best thing we can hope is we develop some MCMC -MC algorithm to sample from pi. And usually the estimator is just taking the empirical mean of our MCMC -MC outputs. But we know that the bias will come from here because only if you run the MCMC -MC for infinitely many steps, it will really converge to pi. And in reality, for any fixed number of iterations, the MCMC -MC output will have a bias. So this is already a challenging task, but there is a remarkable paper in, published in 2020 by Jacob Olivier and Chad, which is published in GRSSB. So the author argue that you can actually debias from your MCMC -MC outputs. And their idea is they can construct a coupling between two MCMC -MC algorithms. So this paper received much attention in the computational stats community. And I think it's for two important reasons. One reason is, first of all, debiasing is quite difficult. People don't really know like uh, how to debias previously. And the second reason is they use the coupling to do the debias. And that's an interesting idea because previously coupling has been mostly used as a probability, like a proof technique to bound the total variation distance or bound the mixing time of Markov chains. But the authors argue you can code them up in your algorithm and that actually gives you interesting results. You can do debias and that could potentially be beneficial for a parallel implementation. So when I talk coupling here, I must mention that the idea of this kind of implementable couplings are not originally from the authors. It originally comes from your very own Val Johnson. It's a paper in 1998, Jasa. So Val used the coupling ideas to do MCMC -MC convergence diagnosis. So that paper not, is not focused on unbiased estimation. So the focus is still different, but this is probably the first paper that really used some coupling algorithm in in really code in really algorithms that people can code up and to do interesting stuff. And this also use coupling to debias, and they have found successful applications, including Bayesian inference, MCMC convergence diagnosis, and asymptotic variance estimation, and so on. So this is still a, like a, this is still an emerging area. So there are papers coming out recently. So two papers that we want to highlight is the first paper is published in 2019. It's about estimating the convergence of Markov chains with L-like couplings by Biswas, Jacob, and Manetti. And the second paper is about a coupling-based convergence assessment for some Gibbs samplers. That's by Biswas and your very, very own Anir Van, and also Jacob and James Jandro. So that's very recently accepted in GRSSB. So that's the second category. As we can see, even as long as the underlying distribution is difficult, the debiasing is already a challenging task. And the third category is you can sample from the underlying distribution, but you want to estimate something more complicated than the expectation. So if the quality of our interest is a function of the expectation, so you want to estimate G of E pi F, and assuming that pi can be perfectly simulated, this type of problem has been extensively studied in the operation research literature. So in this, the standard Monte Carlo estimators will be systematically biased and the bias comes from the nonlinearity of G. And to debias, I think now there are different ways, but the state of the art debiasing technique is called a randomized multi-level Monte Carlo. So this is a framework proposed by Peter Glynn, Chang Henry, Jose Blanchett, and their collaborators. And this is called randomized multi-level Monte Carlo. So their original idea comes from some kind of non-randomized Monte Carlo, multi-level Monte Carlo methods, which is developed by Henrich and Gauss. Those are all applied mathematicians in Europe. So 
Those type of Monte Carlo methods also found lots of applications, including gradient estimation, robust optimization, PDE, and inverse problems. But basically, the second category difficult pi easy t, those mostly happens in the stats community, and this category mostly happens in the operation research community or applied math community. So finally, what we want to do in this work is we also want to estimate g of e pi f. But we feel that in many practical applications, directly sampling from pi is too strong assumption. So what our assumption is, we want to estimate this quantity, but we assume pi can only be approximately sampled by some Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm. So that's basically the main contribution for this work. So I think now maybe in the next part, I will briefly discuss the high level idea of our algorithm design. So, but maybe I could stop here to see if there's any question or if there's anything unclear about the setup of the problem. Yes? Um, when you say ratio of expectations, yeah. do you necessarily mean with respect to the same target distribution or at least in your ID example, uh -huh. like uh, only the temperature parameter was different, but yeah. otherwise the distribution is the same. So. Oh, that's a great question. So I'm essentially saying it can be related to completely different distributions. Yeah. But, but thanks for the question. Yeah, you're right that for the icing example, they are essentially the same distribution. They come from the same model, but with different parameters. Right, and, and in that case, I mean, mm -hmm. one example that immediately comes to mind is base factors. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so that would fall under your- Yeah, exactly, exactly. Thank you. Okay, so now we will, briefly talk about the idea for our algorithm design. So we will first talk about the very high level idea without touching any detail on unbiased MCMC or MLMC. Now we just use them as some debiasing black box. So you put something there and they sort of magically gives you an unbiased estimator. But after talking about the high level idea, I will get into some details to sort of show you how this kind of device mechanism actually works. So, to estimate g of e pi f, we start with a very simple identity, which is displayed here. It says g of e pi f, this is the quantity of our interest. It equals g of e f hat, as long as f hat is an unbiased estimator of e pi f. So mathematically, this equality is, is straightforward because it just follows from the definition of unbiasedness. But it turns out that in in terms of algorithm design, the right-hand side is more tractable than the left-hand side. The reason is, we say that the left-hand side is easy, oh, sorry, it's difficult to debias because both g and the pi can be difficult. The pi is difficult to sample from, so there will be, uh, there will be like a bias come from MCMC output and the g can be difficult. But our observation is this quantity essentially don't really depend on pi, what it really depends is e pi f. So basically it really depends on the expectation. In other words, we can arbitrarily replace this pi by any other probability distribution as long as they maintain the expectation. Therefore, we, don't, we, we are not able to directly sample from pi, that's said, but we don't have to do that. As long as we are able to sample from unbiased estimators of pi then everything still works because this quantity will not be changed if we replace pi by any other distribution as long as it maintains the expectation. So that already reduces the difficulty of our problem. Previously, we don't know how to sample from pi, but in fact, we don't have to do that. If we are able to get unbiased estimators of E pi f, then we can put it into the unbiased MLMC black box and the black box will magically gives us an unbiased estimator. So that sort of reduces the problem, but of course, in the end, we want to answer how do we get unbiased estimators of this e pi f? So that answer is already provided in Jacob et al's paper. They mentioned that if you can cleverly design the coupling of two MCMC algorithms, then the result will be unbiased. So that's a very high level idea. The actual algorithm implementation will be slightly more complicated, but the idea is already here. So as you can imagine, the whole algorithm will be a two-stage algorithm. So in its first stage, it will run the unbiased ML, sorry, the unbiased MCMC algorithm, we will call it K times. And in fact, we'll call it a random amount of time. So it will give us outputs, which are unbiased estimators of E pi F. And then we will use these outputs 
as inputs of the unbiased MLMC framework. So we feed it into the unbiased MLMC framework, and it eventually provides us unbiased estimators of G M pi, which is the quantity of our interest. So this is basically the very high level idea. But of course, like uh, we want to know what really happens and why this kind of de-bias technique actually works. So there are two stages of de-bias here. One is from M MCMC, the other is from MLMC. So I don't have enough time to talk about the MCMC details, but uh, Nirvan is an expert there. So if you have questions, I think, I believe you can ask him. And I will briefly talk about the, the intuition behind the de-bias technique for the multi-level Monte Carlo. So basically we want to estimate G of E pi F and for, to make my life easier, I call E pi F mu. So we want to estimate G mu. What I will do is I want to write G mu as the telescoping sum. So I want to write G mu as an infinite summation. So how do I do that? First of all, before writing it as an infinite summation, I first write it as a limit. And the reason I can write it as a limit is because of the law of large numbers. We know we have unbiased estimators of E pi f or of mu. And if we have many, many of them, we take the average of them, then the law of large numbers tells us the average will converge to mu. So if we have a sequence kn, which goes to infinity as n goes to infinity, then we have the first formula, which is essentially law of large numbers. So the first formula already writes g mu as a limit, but when we have a limit, we can of course transform it into an infinite series by taking the consecutive difference. So the second term, basically we just take the consecutive difference, and now we have written this as an infinite series. The last step is also straightforward. We just call everything in this infinite summation. We call every term delta n here. So, and here this every n stands for a level, which we will choose it in according to some probability distribution that I will tell you in a minute. But basically so far, we have written G mu as an infinite summation. Uh, it seems we're only making things more complicated because the left hand side is a quantity, the right hand side is an infinite summation. But the good news is, Every term in this infinite summation is tractable because it only involves finitely many unbiased estimators. So in principle, we can at least run the unbiased MCMC for kn times and estimate delta n unbiasedly. The bad news is that we still have this infinite summation and in classical computer, we cannot really do any infinite summation. So the second trick is we will choose a random level. We will choose a random n instead of calculating the infinite series what we are doing is we generate a non-negative random integer. We call that a capital N. And we choose that capital N as our random level. We call that a delta capital N. And we use that delta capital N to form a ratio estimator. So this is the estimator we use. And this PN I haven't defined. Basically, that's the probability mass function of my, uh, of my random variable capital N. So this is a ratio estimator. And we claim this estimator is unbiased. So here, this proof actually just follows from the law of conditional expectation. Basically, we can formally calculating out the expectation of this ratio estimator. Of course, we want to first condition on the specific value of delta of capital N. And when capital N is fixed, when capital N equals small n, then the, the denominator here becomes a constant. It becomes P of small n. And here, it becomes delta of small n. And the expectation will be the expectation of delta small n. And finally, since the small n is itself random, so we are taking over all the possibilities. So we are summing them up according to the probability distribution of capital N. So as we can see, the, rate, the, the, the PN term get nicely canceled out. So we get back to our infinite series and the infinite series is the quantity of our interest. So that's the main idea behind this kind of debiasing technique. But uh, what I've done, so far is basically I'm cheating a little bit because here in our actual algorithm like uh, design, the delta n is different from the delta n I just mentioned before. The previous one is just some formal calculation for illustration. In our actual implementation, the kn will be taken as two to the power of n and the delta n will be taken as this kind of, we call this uh, antistatic difference estimator. So it has the same expectation as my previous delta n, but it's slightly more complicated. The reason we use this kind of antithetic 
difference estimator is because we want to reduce the variance of each delta n. The essential reason is, at the end of the day, we want to construct unbiased estimators, but besides unbiasedness, we also want our estimator to have some other nice property. First of all, it needs to have finite variance, and the computational complexity needs to be bounded because in the end, we're using the simulated based algorithm, so we don't want to take forever to calculate one single estimator. So it turns out that only if we're using this kind of antithetic difference estimator, then we can simultaneously control both the variance and the computational cost. If we use the previous estimator, then we can even show that at least one term, either the variance or the computational complexity will be infinity, so which is not good for us. And the mathematical reason this kind of design gives us some benefits actually come from Taylor expansion. So as you can imagine, if we do Taylor expansion of the right-hand side function on S2n over 2n on this point, then if you do the Taylor expansion, you will find under this antithetic difference design, both the constant term and the linear term will be canceled out. So the leading term will be the quadratic term. However, in the original, like uh, in the more vanilla versions delta n, if you do the same Taylor expansion, you will find only the constant term gets canceled out and the leading term will be the linear term. So it turns out that canceling out the linear term is crucial for us to do variance reduction. And it is in turn crucial for us to control both the variance and the computational complexity simultaneously. So that's the, basically the third trick, which is the antithetic difference design. Uh, how much time do I have, actually? <laughs> okay. Okay, so now, basically, I've already finished discussing my estimator, so, but I, now I formally, like, uh, write it here. Essentially, it's just uh, as I just described. Basically, we're sampling, uh, like, a non-negative random variable. And we use that random variable to call the subroutine. The subroutine give us unbiased estimators for e pi f, which is basically, you can imagine the subroutine to be the estimator used in Jacob Audrey and the Charles paper. So we call this multiple times to get multiple unbiased estimators of e pi f. And then we use those estimators to form this delta capital N, this antithetic difference estimator, and then finally come up with this kind of ratio estimator. So that's the whole algorithm. And we needed to give some theoretical justification of the algorithm. Basically, what we want is we wanted to have finite variance and a finite computational complexity. Of course, in the future, we want to have sharper estimates on how, what's the actual cost, like the dependency of the underlying dimensionality. But now, for the first step, we just want to control them to be finite simultaneously. So, this algorithm is a two-step or two-stage algorithm. So our assumption are posed on both the unbiased MCMC -MC output and the, uh, and the smoothness of the function G. So we actually have four assumptions, and I will discuss them very briefly. The first assumption basically guarantees our algorithm can be implemented without bugs. So that's mostly for computational issues. That's not a really like a technical assumption. The second assumption is the smoothness assumption on G. So we do need G to have certain nice behavior, but we only need G to be locally smooth. So we require the function G to be locally smooth in the neighborhood of E pi F. The locally smooth means we need it to have continuous derivative and the derivative needs to be alpha holder continuous. So for example, like in, in, in many practical examples, for example, when G is a quadratic function, then the derivative is Lipschitz continuous, which automatically satisfies the second assumption. And again, this is mostly a local assumption. So we, what we really care is the behavior of G near a neighborhood of the uh, underlying expectation. So we don't need any global control of G. And the third assumption is the moment assumption on the output for the unbiased MCMC -MC estimator. We require the output. The output is itself a random variable, which is unbiased for E pi f. And we require the output to have finite L's moment, and L is some number which is strictly greater than 2. So we do require some moment assumption on the output, and we will verify this assumption maybe in two minutes. So this is not a trivial assumption, but uh, we can verify it. Basically, we can say something if the underlying Markov chain makes it reasonably faster, then this assumption can be satisfied. 
So finally, this is like a trade-off assumption because this is a two-stage algorithm. Basically, the last assumption says there is a trade-off between the smoothness and the moment. If you have stronger moment assumption on the outside function g, then you can have slightly more relaxed assumption on the moment of the unbiased MCMC -MC output. And similarly, if the Markov chain makes really fast, then you can argue your unbiased MCMC -MC output has all finite moments. Then it will you you can you are able to relax a little bit on the smooth assumption on G. So basically, this reflects the trade-off between the smoothness and the moment, which appears on both on the two components of our algorithm. So after all the assumptions are satisfied, then basically we're saying. Basically, we're saying this estimator, which is the output of our algorithm, has three properties. The first property is it has the correct expectation, and it has a finite variance and a finite computational complexity. So in fact, there could be some like a formula to bound the computational complexity, but uh, like I don't want to display it here. So basically, it says it's a correct estimator, and it has finite variance, finite computational complexity. And the two and the three together gives us the give us another complexity bound, which means suppose you want the mean square error to be controlled by epsilon. It means your expected computational complexity is of order O of one over epsilon square. So that matches the canonical root given by the central limit theorem. Basically we're saying this estimator gives us the, doesn't give us really like suboptimal roots in terms of convergence. But I have to mention that I'm saying the computational complexity is big O of one over epsilon square, and there are many, many hidden constants of this big O. The big O may depend on the underlying dimensionality of the problem, depends on the mixing time of our Markov chain, depends on the smoothness of our outside function G. So this itself, like the dependency for any of the constants can be very bad. And in fact, I'm mostly interested in the dependency with the underlying dimensionality, but I haven't get any like a quantitative result of this kind. So now I know it's big O of one over epsilon square, but I don't know whether that it depends like uh, how good or how bad it depends on the dimensionality. So lastly, we verify the moment assumption. Basically, this is the formal like uh, statement, but this is the English statement. <laughs> it basically says if my if f has more than else moment under the stationary distribution and my Markov chain and my Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm makes very fast, makes very fast means it has a positive spectral gap or means it's geometrically ergodic, then my output and unbiased MCMC algorithm will have the will satisfy the moment assumption that we require. So basically, if the MCMC or if the coupling algorithm works reasonably well, then the assumption should be fine. So finally, we generalize our methodology to the nested expectation problem. So in a general form, the nested expectation is like this one. This is an expectation, but it's quite complicated. It's an expectation of a function where the function depends on gamma x, and the gamma x is basically the conditional expectation. So, but the good thing is when x is fixed, when x is fixed, then the quantity depends on gamma x, but gamma x is now basic, or oh, the quantity of our interest is just this fx gamma x, and this is now a function of an expectation. Although when x is fixed, that's a function of the conditional expectation. So we can generalize our method to estimate this quantity unbiasedly, but the only thing we need to change is previously we are estimating a function of the expectation, but now we are estimating the function of the conditional expectation. So what we are doing is for, we sample x from its marginal distribution. This step can be like a, can be like criticized because in some situations this cannot be done. But if it can be done, then we can do the same mechanism when x is fixed. We can use the same framework as we just described to estimate this fx gamma x quantity, and this quantity can be a biased estimate. We will finally have the same ratio estimator, although it now depends on x, but after considering the randomness in X, the estimator is still unbiased for the nested expectation. So I think that already concludes the like uh, method parts, and maybe I'll do a very quick. So how? Okay, I'll do a very quick like uh, <laughs> illustration on the numerical examples. 
So we first consider a very poor example, but for this example, we know all the ground truths, so we can compare them with our estimator. So basically, we want to the estimator. Oh, sorry, the underlying probability distribution is the product of the beta distribution. So x is a random vector, and each component is an independent beta distribution, but with different parameter. What we want to estimate is this product of inverse expectation. So this time, it is a function of the expectation. And because of the beta, beta is our good friend, we know everything about the beta. So this quantity can be explicitly calculated out. We know the ground truth is basically grows linearly with the dimensionality of our random vector. And we run our algorithm on this example. So here, this solid line stands for our estimate. We will find this solid line is essentially the line y equals k plus one, which means at least it gives a reasonable or accurate estimate. And I want to mention that for this one, this is actually not a difficult pi problem because we know how to directly sample from beta. But to fit this into our framework, we still use an MCMC algorithm to sample from the beta distribution. Although if we want, we can sample them directly. But uh, we just uh, use MCMC to do this. And this error bar stands for the standard deviation. In fact, the twice of the standard deviation of our Monte Carlo estimate. And I'm interested in like uh, the scalability with respect to dimensionality. So I also plot this. This is the empirical variance versus the underlying dimensionality k. So as we can see, when the dimension increases, our estimate will be more and more unstable, which is sort of expected. But now from this plot, I still don't have like a clear idea on how bad it is, whether this curve like a uh, scale like quadratically with dimension or exponentially with dimensions. So far, I don't have any clue on that. And the second example is on the icing model. So the icing model is just what we talked in the motivating example. And we estimate the true quantity. One is the inverse of the natural statistics, but uh, maybe I'll just uh, talk about the second quantity, which is the ratio of normalization constants. So for this ratio, we know it's a ratio of normalization constants, and it's a ratio of two expectations, so we can apply our previous framework. Then we choose basically a sequence of theta1 and a sequence of theta2 for every pair, we use our algorithm to estimate this quantity. But for this case, we already don't know the ground truth. So what we are doing is for both the numerator and the denominator, we run a Gibbs sampler to sample from this IC. We run a Gibbs sampler for many steps. In fact, I think we run it for 1 million steps. And we use the Gibbs sampler's estimate and plug it in to form an estimate of the ratio. So that estimate will be accurate if we run the Gibbs sampler long enough but it will be biased. So like uh, if you have multiple processor and uh, a limited budget for each processor, then this estimator probably like uh, cannot be implemented for that long time. But we run it for very long time. So we believe that estimate is fairly accurate and we compare our result with the result from the Gibbs sampler. So in fact, uh, this, we, we do the like a uh, curve plot. And in fact, uh, there is supposed to be two curves the solid is our estimate, and the dashed line is the Gibbs estimator. But in fact, they are just indistinguishable with each other. So it is basically tells the two estimates agree with each other. And I think in terms of a single estimator, the Gibbs sampler may have smaller variance, but our estimator have the like a good property of unbiasedness. So we actually run this on a computer cluster of like 500 processors independently and averaging all our estimates. So, uh, and there are also uh, like a, a few more numerical examples, including a small, like a real data example on our manuscript. So that's our nested expectation. So if you're interested, feel free to check that out. But I think now it's time to conclude this talk. Basically what we are doing is we construct the unbiased estimator of this kind of G of E pi F. It's a function of the expectation and we assume we can not directly sample from pi. We assume pi can only be sampled by MCMC algorithm. That's different from the previous like a standard assumption in operation research. So uh, our technique is basically combining the multi-level Monte Carlo and the uh, unbiased uh, MCMC methods. So this idea can be as extended to the net state expectation since that's regarded as a challenging application. And it can be easily parallelizable because we can run it independent. It's actually called embarrassingly parallel because I just run everything on an independent processor and finally aggregate all these results.
but at least uh, like uh, this is something like uh, difficult for the sequential algorithms like MCMC. <laughs> And there are many challenges remain. For example, first of all, I would like to know if there's any interesting, other interesting applications. And I want to know like, uh, if there's, I don't think the current design is already optimal. There are some lots of tuning parameters there for the coupling algorithm. There is some, uh, there are two parameters. I think in the paper, they call it K and M. Basically that's the start and the end of the algorithm. And there is an extra parameter called the lag, which sort of uh, influence the performance of the estimator and the stability. And also for the unbiased ML MC algorithm, there's tuning parameter because we can choose the parameter for the, for the discrete random variable. So there are many parameters that we can tune and currently I don't know what will be the optimal, like uh, optimal choice of this estimator or if there's any efficient way of systematically tuning this parameter. And finally, we want to know whether our method can be generalized to solve the general functional T. So in all the examples, we can already do function of expectation or nested expectation but we still don't know how to do a bias estimator for quantile. I think that's a very interesting application that I want to solve, but so far I don't know how to do that. So that are, I think, several of the interesting and uh, challenges, both like computationally, method uh, methodologically and uh, theoretically. Okay, so I think that's all for my talk and I would like to thank everyone for coming and I'm happy to answer any question if you have. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, yeah. very nice talk. I'll open this up to the audience now. Yes. Yeah. Two oh, sure. Very nice talk. Thank so, you. Uh, I will say both questions and then you can decide. Which other <laughs> yeah. So the first question is with a nested expectation. Mm -hmm. So the example, the motivating example option has a max function, which obviously would not be smooth. So yeah. I'm wondering if that creates any difficulties uh, in, in how it runs. Like you had a result with a general function f, uh -huh. and if it's a max function, I'm just not sure oh. what happens. Oh, yeah. Uh, and then the second question is when you call the subroutine, you have to call it 2 to the power n times. Yes. So I, I know you can do it in parallel, but mm -hmm. 2 to the power n is polynomial. So yeah. in practice, sort of how small that is. Oh, that's a, so both are great questions. So uh, for the first question about the like a max function, I guess you mean max is difficult because it has, it's not differentiable everywhere. So I think in terms of algorithm implementation, everything can still be feeding to the algorithm and uh, it can be done with no problem. But the, it will, the non-smoothness of max will give some like a technical problem if we analyze the property of this unbiased estimators, especially basically the max function is like this. And our previous assumption basically says the function needs to be smooth enough on the neighborhood of the expectation. So if the expect real expectation is here or here, then it won't be that prob problematic because in the neighborhood of this is still a linear function. But if the true expectation just stands here, then that will give trouble for the theoretical uh, investigation. So I haven't done theory for this particular optimal stopping in this case, but there, I have another paper uh, just uh, doing the unbiased optimal stopping, but that's with the assumption we can actually sample from the underlying distribution. In that case, we can sort of solve this kind of problem, but we still need some extra assumption on the distribution. But basically, even the expectation happens at the, exactly the bad point, it's still like a, possibly it's still doable, but we do need other assumptions to control the chance that it's in this neighbor. So it needs some more subtle assumptions. And for the implementation, implementation time, so I think that's one very good point that it actually runs two to the power of n times. So that could be inefficient. Although in practice, so basically that n is chosen by a geometric distribution and the geometric distribution usually have we can prove that has success probability greater than 0.5. Usually we choose 0.6 or 0.7. So in most applications, this capital N will not be a huge number, but like, uh, and in practice, usually now we run those algorithms. I think it can be reasonably run for like a dimension, like hundreds of dimensions, but uh, we haven't tried larger scale examples. But, but that's one thing that caused our concern. So 
even though we have geometric random variable which has an exponential tail, it still have chance to take a large number. So we do observe like sometimes it will take a long time for the algorithm to implement. So we are trying, so that's why I'm saying I, I would like to try different algorithm design to see if I can get rid of this issue. Yeah, but thanks, both are excellent questions. Just to follow up on her first question about the max, is it possible to help by like using the soft max instead of the max? Oh, that's a great, yeah, that, that could help. Yeah, that, that, if you use the soft max, then that will automatically Solve the, the solve the technical issue, but you are doing approximations, so that itself also brings you a little bit of bias. So yeah, but if you like this, if you are able to sort of, if you are okay with this trade off, then definitely I, I would uh, like to recommend that you just uh, solve this next. Yes. Oh yes. Uh -huh. level, yeah. Uh, and the level is coming from underlying geometric distribution. Yeah. Uh, do you know, like, what's your exact uh, order of complexity in terms of your dimension, in terms of your sample size, in terms of your levels? And if you try to just, like, you know, instead of drawing it from the weight distribution, do you know that if you can try to make it fixed, then you can just avoid the whole exponential uh, part? Do you know that in terms of your implementation, if that is Oh, so I guess, uh, yeah, thanks for the question. I guess in practice, you cannot really fix the geometric or even truncate the geometric random variable. So if you, I guess the question is, do you really want unbiasedness? Because even if you sort of can control the bias to a very low level, then that's probably also fine. If you are okay with this, then you can truncate your geometric random variable. So that will give you like a much better guarantee on the computational complexity. But if you really need a Biasness, then somehow you must have uh, the cap the random variable capital N. Even we can try different design, but one sort of necessary condition is the support needs to cover all the possible integers. That's how because that's how we transfer the infinite summation to a finite summation. And in practice, this two to the power of n, this we will call the algorithm the two to the power of n time. But n itself is like a geometric distribution with probability you